how the head was going to move, heads float over the platter. When the drive spins up, they are in a parked position. And when the head floats over the platter, it is done by the air pressure that is pushing up and causes it to do what's called the fly height and actually causes the head to float over the platter and move. If it's stopped in the middle, the slider, which is the head that is mounted on the head, uh, or the head is mounted on it, is a very smooth surface, some made out of ferrite, some made out of a couple different uh, types of material. They will, they're non-porous, so they stick together, and it will cause some physical damage. So, <clears throat> so in the process of doing this, they came up with, well, where do we park this head? And this became a big problem. Well, it turns out that the center ring of the drive, where the motor is closest to, causes a problem for storing data. They could not store data in that center location because of uh, electromagnetic interference. So it would actually cause bits to flip and bits to miss and bits to not be there. So they've always had this little ring in the middle of the drive that they just couldn't use. Um, and it makes a lot of sense, too, because of the design of the drive. Uh, a lot of the important content is on that outer edge. So there's a reason that there's, uh, there's even more beyond the tracks that your data is stored on. There's content about the drive that's actually stored on the outer edge as well. And that was why they chose the outer edge for that content, is that the closer you got to the center, the worse the, the, the bits were, and that they physically would start to uh, dissipate, flip bits, um, do a number of different things. So they, the other problem, though, is that when you park your head there, it was still smooth, just like the rest of the disk. So they basically did some terraforming here. Basically, they figured out an angle that they could cut these little grooves. And they, you know, it's hard to see exactly, but you can see it does, it's not scraped. This isn't damaged to the drive. It is actually cut into a fashion where there's peaks so that there's nothing really smooth for the drive's head to actually stick to. And then they filled that with lubrication. So you have lubrication and the peaks and valleys so that there is no porous surface for it to stick to. So a lot of thought went there. There are drives that, are, that do park their head on the outside beyond the edge of the platter. They have a ramp and they actually move the head to that location. It's a more recent event. Uh, most of those physically um, came into play in the, in the late 90s or something around those by IBM. But, uh, but I just thought that was a really cool thing and that there was a, a lot that you know, people just didn't understand with regards to that and they can't store data there anyway. So that's why they use that particular location. <coughs> Number two, and I still have. All right. Can anybody tell me why your data will disappear from your memory stick if you put it in a drawer for 10 years? So he gets a shirt. Security University. I hope that's your size. <laughs> Okay, so ultimately what happens here is that, and this is mainly just so people understand and know, because most of the memory sticks that we're using now, we've not had that long. Basically, I mean, we're talking, you know, within the last five, six years that's, you know, become affordable. NAND chips that the design for memory sticks is based on is actually very old. It's been around since 1984. And it was used in some early stuff. Uh, Intel was one of the first companies to actually use it in 86. Uh, but it basically dropped in price uh, over time. And then in the last five, six years has become something that we commonly use and don't even think anything about. But the fact of the matter is, if you take some pictures, you take some data, and you do like you did with your old camera, where you just, uh, you know, I threw it in a drawer, and in 10 years you come back. So for people who are doing forensics who need long-term storage, wow, that's not going to work. You got to like keep coming back, refresh, because basically what will happen is in NAND memory, uh, you will basically have a cell, and the cell will store an electron, a charge, and it, it doesn't die per se. Uh, it it basically just kind of fades. It, it escapes, if you want to put it that. It loses capacitance. So over time, that's going to escape, and people generally now think it will happen about eight to ten years. So. Now, we do have some older systems that do have some flash in them that were not. Uh, there was two types of, of memory that were used. It was NOR and NAND. And NOR, you typically know as like your BIOS and things like that. And that will last a long time. But the NAND flash that has been on maybe your old motherboards, 15 years old or something, if they were using it, very expensive. But there was a few. Um, you may not be able to power those systems back on again someday because it's already dissipated, already been released, something's already caused the problem. And it may not be all the cells, it may just be a few. 
So they will actually fade. You will actually lose capacitance. So don't try storing your long-term stuff on a memory stick. Uh, when you plug it into a machine, there is a process that it actually runs through for wear, wear leveling, where it moves the content around. The content is constantly moving around on the disk itself when you plug it in. All the, and so if you want to know more about that, I've got a previous solid state speech where I've described it. I show how it works and what actually happens. But uh, the cells are released, and then their cells are filled, and then it moves them around and shuffles them around. So all the right uh, counts are about equal for all the cells. But just so you know, don't put your stuff in a drawer and wait for a really long time. Now, this one's kind of what I do from a standpoint of uh, repairing stuff and doing stuff. Um, I repair a hard drive, and this is one of my primary components for repairing a hard drive. Not that I take them and I have like a lot of energy or anything, but uh, you guys may recognize this guy here. <laughs> and he's wearing a Schmookon shirt, coincidentally. Uh, so that Sky Dog back in the back, what's that? He looks like trouble. <laughs> he was. He was. It was. He was a terrible influence on the rest of the class. So. But uh, so he took, he took my class, and so he can attest to this, that this is true and that we can do it. He's actually rebuilt drives in an open environment on a table with no clean room, and we have a set of drives, and he's physically rebuilt three? How many, how many was it? <laughs> yeah, because you know he know you notice he is the only one that's actually wearing his gloves. So these people had less of a success rate. <laughs> so anyway, because what happens is when the platter spins up, it's not the dust and stuff that's really a problem. The problem is flakes of dead skin off your face, your hair, your stuff that has oil on it sticks to the platters and it will not escape uh, from the platter when it spins. But I use a. Uh, I, I basically take the ginseng, I remove the pills from the ginseng, I cut them into strips, and I make something like this. Some of you may know these as head comb tools. Their comb tools are fairly expensive if you're ever going to replace a head, and they'll typically cost like $200. And I make this out of like 50 cents. And they are better than any combs I have ever used in my whole life. You basically start at the rear of the drive, you insert it. The nice thing is this doesn't touch the head itself. You actually are moving this up into the metal component itself right before the head, uh, the suspension itself. And then you're able to actually remove the head. And they actually will stay high enough up that you can just reinsert them back in, back in the drive. So if that's, uh, that's what I got. Thank <laughs> you.